they had rejected is never really considered a good thing, right? When, when people reject us, it gets in our mind and we think, well, what's wrong with me? What have I done? What mistakes have I made that this person or this group has rejected me? And I would dare say, probably everybody in this room, at one time or another, we've been rejected, right? And maybe we look at our rejection and we think, man, I just wish Jesus understood. I wish Jesus understood what it's like for their, your family to turn their back on you, or your best friend, or, or co-workers, or, or even society. I wish Jesus understood what that was like. If you were here last week, we found out He knows exactly but on a scale that's much higher than anything you and I can understand. Because Jesus was rejected time and time and time again. It was like waves that just crashed over Him that could have easily been very, very overwhelming because He was rejected by His own people, the Jewish people. He was rejected by the Roman authorities that knew He hadn't done anything wrong, and yet they still sent us to death. And he was rejected by his very own disciples, the men that he had poured himself into for three and a half years. And they just rejected him. And in the end, he was all by himself. Jesus knows what it feels like to be rejected. And the thing for Jesus is his rejection would ultimately lead to his death. Because people turn their back on him, he's going to die. But the purpose in his death going to be good for us, but it's going to be excruciating for him. Now I'm a minister, so I deal with death a lot. I've had to do a lot of funerals since I've been at Rich Acres this summer, craziest time since I've been here for people that died just one right after the other. I deal with that. You guys deal with that. And in our church, in our community, funerals are pretty much done the same way. Okay, typically you have a visitation time and then you have the funeral and, and in the funeral there might be music or people get up and say some things about the person. A, a preacher will try to give a positive message from Scripture just to, to build comfort and peace and hope in people's lives. And then the family will leave there, typically go to the cemetery and then they'll have a graveside service and the, and the person is buried and that's where they are and you can go back and you can pay your respects or you can go visit that place and remember that person. It's pretty normal for us, but it's not typical for all cultures. And there are people that do this differently. They handle death in a different way. In fact, in the United States, do you realize that there is a group uh, that's really pushing for green funerals? You know, what I mean by green funerals are funerals that are good for the environment. And so what they'll do is you skip the embalming process. You don't embalm the person. You don't put them in a concrete uh, holding thing. I can't remember the name of it right now. You don't put them in those. And you put them in these boxes that are made of willow that apparently uh, degrades very, very quickly. And so those people will go back to the earth as their body decomposes. And then that, you know, the whole circle of life thing, and that helps out. So people say, we should be more green in that. In fact, there's even one company that they will take your remains if you're cremated, and they will press them into a sphere. And they will put a hook on it, and they will hang it on a reef in the bottom of the ocean. And so again, as it begins to decompose, it helps with it back to the earth, that whole kind of thing. And so there are people that are trying to go green when it comes to funerals and it comes to death. Okay, that might seem a little weird, but okay, I can understand it a little bit. But there are other cultures that see death very, very differently. There's a lot of ethnic groups in the Philippines, and one's called the Vignette, and they blindfold their dead and place them next to the main entrance of their house. That's how they deal with it. The Tinguin people, they dress bodies in their best clothes, sit them in a chair, and place a lit cigarette in their lips. Okay? Kind of different, right? All right. The Kavino the people bury their dead in a hollowed out trunk. So when someone becomes ill, they go out and select the tree that they are going to be buried in. And then the Apeo people from the Philippines, they bury their dead under the kitchen. I don't know. I'm not sure about that one. It's all the information I got. Grandma's under the kitchen. I don't know. Maybe her spirit will help people who can't cook. Okay? <laughs> but the craziest one that I saw was from Madagascar, the 
Malagasy people do something called Famadahana, or it's the turning of the bones. So every five to seven years, they go to their family crypt and they bring out the bodies of their ancestors and they've been wrapped in cloth and then they spray them with wine or perfume and then as a band plays, they will walk around holding their ancestors. And while they're holding them and celebrating, they will tell them the news of the family. What's been going on with Cousin Eddie? And what's been going on with your sister and your grandkids or whatever? And they kind of fill them in. And then some people will even ask those people for a blessing. You know, we want you to bless our family. Thank you. And so, so that's how they handle death. That's how they handle funerals. It's unusual for us. We go, man, that's weird. But for their culture, that's not weird at all. That's not strange at all. Because that's how they handle death. See, it doesn't really matter how we handle death. Death is coming. The latest statistics I could find were from 2014. And in the United States alone, 2,626,418 people died in 2014. Just in the United States alone. There's a woman by the name of Emma Morano who lives in Italy who is the officially documented oldest person in the world. Now there's some other people that say they're older, but this is the official document and she is 116 years old. But still, it doesn't matter because if Jesus does not come back, the death rate is 100% for everyone. Okay, for all of us in this room, death is 100%. It is going to happen no matter what. That's just the way it's going to be. And when you and I die, I'm sorry, but there's probably not going to be a lot of fanfare. Okay, I doubt if they will fly the flags at half mast. I, I doubt if you will be on the news, unless it's a real crazy kind of death. But if we just die naturally, being who we are, just normal people, the world is not going to step up and take notice. In fact, maybe just your family and friends will be the only people that know. Because that's how death is for most people. But Jesus' death was different. Now, it wasn't a really big deal when he died. I mean, for the people that were there. He was just another criminal. Uh, another person that had been found guilty of crimes. And so, he was crucified. And, and it happened. But it wasn't this huge deal. <laughs> The world didn't stop as far as people were concerned. It did for the disciples and, and the others that had gathered themselves around Jesus. But it was just not that big of a deal. But Jesus' death was a huge deal for those people and for us as well. Jesus' death meant something different than it's meant, meant for anybody else that's ever lived. So we're going to talk about that this morning. So if you've got your Bibles, would you turn to Mark chapter 15? Mark chapter 15. We're going to go and, and we're going to read some verses in here about Jesus, what he experienced, the things that uh, were a part of his death, things that went on to him. And I just want to read it to you from Mark chapter 15. And then as we go through, I want you to notice all of the things that are happening to Jesus in his death process. The things that are going to happen to his body, to his mind, and to his spirit. And we're going to pick it up in Mark chapter 15 and verse 16. Mark chapter 15, verse 16. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again, they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. <laughs> Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him, dividing up his clothes. They cast lots to see what each would give. 
It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The king of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right, one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. The same way the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that, he may, that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed. His last. See, if you look at that scripture, if you look at the details that Mark provides us in there, you see what Jesus had to endure in order to die. You see the things that were a part of his death. Man, at the very beginning, the soldiers, they brought him together and, and they put a crown of thorns on his head and they bowed down in front and they mocked him and, and they worshipped him. Hail, King of the Jews! And then they would hit him with a staff on his head, pressing that crown of thorns farther into his skull. And they just made fun of him and they were relentless and imagined the beating that he had already taken up to this point that Mark doesn't talk about. And so he's in this horrible state right now, but then they take him out to be crucified. They take him to a place called Golgotha. It's a hill where people coming in and out of Jerusalem, they could see people who were crucified there. And it says that he took Jesus and, and they crucified him. He is going through pain that you and I cannot fathom in our minds. I don't care how bad your pain has been, what surgery you have been through, what other issue you have dealt with, you and I cannot imagine the pain that Jesus is going through as they nail his hands and his feet and they raise him up on that cross. And so he's going through the pain of just simply trying to push up on his feet, on that nail so that he can let air out and get more oxygen in. And imagine the pain that he's dealing with. But then as he's there hanging on the cross, people are just passing by and they begin to make fun of him. And they mock him. And they laugh at him and go, hey, you said you were going to tear down the temple and rebuild it in three days. Surely you'd come off a cross. And then the religious leaders, that religious elite group, the Jews who should have known who Jesus was, that he was the Messiah. What are they doing? They're heaping insults as well. They're continuing to mock him. And Mark says even the criminals that had been crucified with him, they mocked him as well. Well, at least one of them, they made fun of him. So Jesus is agonizing in pain and the people are mocking him from all sides. And can you hear the laughter going through the crowd as people make these comments? But then it's a little farther when I think the pain and the agony was eclipsed by something else. It was eclipsed when Jesus looked at God and said, God, why have you forsaken? See, for the first time in Jesus' existence since creation until now, Jesus felt separated from his dad. He felt forsaken by his God. And I can't help but think in my mind that was worse than the pain or the mocking. Anything that he had gone through up to that point. He felt separated from his dad. And then at some point later, it says he simply breathed his life. And he died. What did Jesus' death mean for him? Man, agony like you and I can't imagine. Man, suffering like we can't compare. It meant a separation for the first time from his dad. And it was excruciating. And then he breathed his last. But then Mark is going to give us a verse. He's going to tell us something that I think for us, we look at it and we go, okay, no big deal. But it is a huge, huge deal. Did you 
look back in chapter 15 and verse 38, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. He just kind of plugs that in there. He wants to make sure that we know that this happened, but for most of us, we don't even understand what that means. The curtain of the temple, or the veil as it's called, was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, I want you to imagine with me, just for a couple of minutes, that you're in the temple that the Jews would worship in. I've told you kind of what that looked like and the different areas that different people could go in. But if you remember, I told you at the very front of the temple, there was the place called the Holy of Holies. And within the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant contained the Ten Commandments that God had given to Moses, contained some manna, contained the rod that Aaron had that budded. And all this took place when the Jews were wandering in the desert. And so this Ark of the Covenant was put in there, and that's where God's presence came. And God's presence was contained in that area. And so people knew that that's a place that you don't go to that's called the Holy of Holies. Now, the Holy of Holies was separated from the rest of the temple by a curtain, by a veil. Now, you need to understand, this is not just a curtain like what I have here. This curtain was 60 feet tall. I don't know. My best guess, 30, 40 feet, our ceiling here, you're going to have to go a couple stories higher than even what our building is. That's how tall it was, 60 feet tall. Then it was 30 feet wide. If you go from the edge of the screen on each side, that's about 30 feet. That's how wide it was. But then the amazing thing to me is how thick it was. Four inches thick. It's the width of my hand. I measured it. The width of my hand right there, that's how thick that curtain was. And that curtain was put in place before God's presence was there. And once that curtain was in place and God's presence were there, you didn't go there. Because the Jews knew God is a holy God. God was a God to be feared. They would never try to or even attempt to go into God's presence. In fact, when Moses got the Ten Commandments when he was on the mountain, God said, Moses, you tell them, don't even come and touch the base of the mountain. If you just touch the base of the mountain, you're going to die. And so for the Jews, they knew that curtain showed a physical separation between them and God. In fact, only one person could go behind that curtain. They could only go one time a year, and that was the high priest. And the high priest would go behind that curtain with a sacrifice, with blood, to plead on behalf of the Jews for God's forgiveness to be on them. One time a year, he was the only one allowed to go back there. And so for the Jews to see this curtain was a clear picture of them, of the separation between them and a holy God. And they would never dream of going behind that curtain. And Mark comes along and he says, Jesus breathed his last. And the very next thing he tells us is, and the curtain in the temple was torn from the top to the bottom in two. All right, understand, 60 foot by 30 foot, four inches thick. This is not something done by man. The one that couldn't get high enough up there to do it. Okay, man did not tear this curtain, and the earthquake, which the other Gospels tell us happened, did not cause this uh, curtain to tear. It tore from the top to the bottom because God tore it. And when his son Jesus died, he tore that curtain and he said, there will no longer be a separation between me and my children. Because Jesus died, because he was perfect, because his blood was spilled, that was going to take the place of us. That was going to be the punishment that God had to give to us because of our sin. All that has been taken care of. It has been torn. It is now open. To show that we have access to God. So when that temple curtain tore. If there were people in there. If there were people outside looking in. If people came in later. They would see that thing torn. And it would blow their minds. They would go. You know maybe they, the priests were going. Don't look. Don't look. You, you, you know you're not allowed to look up there. And I bet you these priests. These chief uh, elders. All those people. You know what they did. They got a sewing crew on that thing quick. 
They're like, man, we got to get that thing sewed up because nobody can go back there. You're not allowed to go into God's presence. And I can just see them scrambling. Dolph, look, with the people that go, what in the world? The curtain has been torn. There's now not this separation between us and God. You see, Jesus' death destroyed the barrier between them and God. There was a physical, visible barrier between them and the presence of God. And that had been destroyed when the curtain had been torn from top to bottom. But what you need to understand, family, is this. That curtain should mean as much to us as it did the Jews. Because that curtain being torn meant we were no longer separated from God. That we were going to have the right, because of Jesus' death, to step into the presence of God and to talk to our Heavenly Father. Hey, if you've got your Bibles, would you turn with me to Hebrews? And I'm going to give you time to turn because you need to see this, all right? It's in the New Testament toward the back. All right, I want you to find the book of Hebrews, chapter 10. Because there's some verses there that we need to read so that you understand that that curtain being torn was not only a big deal to them, it was a big deal to us as well. I'm going to start in verse 19. Hebrews chapter 10. I'm going to start in verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is His body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Look at verse 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. Do you see what the Hebrews writer there says? He says we have confidence to enter the holy place. We have confidence to step behind that curtain. Why? Because we're so good? No, because of the blood of Jesus. He says by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is His body. The curtain was replaced by Jesus. And now if we want to go into the presence of our Father, we simply step into Jesus. That curtain, that separation has been torn away and now Jesus is there. And he says we can draw near to God, sincere hearts. We're, we have this full assurance because we have faith in who Jesus is and who he said he was. That He has torn that curtain, that separation down between us and God. And now we can come to God. And then He says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For He who promised is faithful. Who promised this? God promised it. God promised it back in the Old Testament all the way through. And He's going to promise all the way through to the end of the Bible. That we can be saved. That we can come to God. We can come in His presence through Jesus Christ. So I want you to imagine that what, what keeps us from God now is our sin. And this curtain is going to represent your sin and it's going to represent my sin. And when we sin, we cannot step into the presence of a holy God. We can. God cannot be in sin, around sin. His holiness will not allow that. So you and I have the curtain of sin in our lives. And when that's there, we can't step into God's presence. But Jesus came and He said, I'm going to die in your place. And so Jesus simply removed the curtain between us and God. We get to go into God's presence because Jesus died. We get to go in all of our filth, in all of our dirtiness, in all of our sin, because as we step toward God and we accept Jesus, and Jesus' blood covers over us, our sins are washed away, and we walk into the presence of God, not by our own works, but by what Jesus 
did for us. That's how we have the right to walk into the presence of a holy God. With hope. With unending, overwhelming hope. Because Jesus died. What did Jesus' death mean to him? It meant excruciating pain. It meant mockery. It meant being separated from his father for a time. What does Jesus' death mean for you and me? It means that we can step into the presence of God. It means that if we will accept Jesus one day, we can hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant. It means that we will live for eternity in God's presence. Not because of what we do, but because of what Jesus did. It's just a little short verse. Mark just plugs it in there for us and Jesus breathed his last and the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And I don't want you to ever look at that verse the same way again. Because it wasn't just a big deal for the Jews that were living at that time. It is a huge deal for you and for me. Because Jesus stepped in. He became, became that curtain. He became the thing that we go through to get to our heaven. But you can only step in the presence of God if you have Jesus. So you're only promised eternal life in heaven if you have accepted Jesus. And maybe you're here this morning and you go, listen, Tim, if you knew me, if you knew what I had done, if you knew the kind of life that I was living, you would understand how God could not love. You would understand how I am not worthy to accept the gift that extreme. Somebody dying in my place. Let me just go ahead and put your mind at ease. I'm not worthy. The elders of this church are not worthy. The deacons in this church are not worthy, nor are Sunday school teachers, no, nor are people who have been a part of this church since it started, or people who became a part of this church last month. My dad and my mom are here visiting. My dad is here. My dad is one of the, the most spiritual men that I know, but he's not worthy. So let me put your mind at ease. If you say, I'm not worthy of that kind of gift, join the club. Yet God said, if you will accept my son, if you will accept his sacrifice, you step into my presence boldly and with confidence, knowing that your sins have been forgiven. It doesn't matter if you feel unworthy. You're worth it. Maybe you feel too worthy. Maybe you feel like you got it all together. And you're like, look, why don't you to say that? But I'm pretty awesome. I go to church, read my Bible. I give an offering. I help people in the community. In fact, if you would ask people in this community, they'd say that's one of the best people I know. Tim, I'm good to go. I'll just I'll stand before God and go, God, I got this whole list. Look, look at this whole list of things that I did. I was awesome. It's not going to work because it's not about what you did. It's what about what Jesus did. So if you think you're good enough, if you think you're going to just squeak in there, let me say to you, apart from the blood of Jesus Christ, you will be condemned. So it really doesn't matter if you don't feel worthy or you feel too worthy or where you are in the scale between those two things. We all have got to have Jesus Christ. There is a curtain between us called sin. And that sin is taken care of by the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if we will accept it, we step boldly before God. That curtain is removed. Jesus puts himself there. And we pray in his name. We go to Jesus and ask him to talk to his dad on our behalf. You see, you don't have to go to a priest. You don't have to go to a preacher. You don't have to go to ask somebody to speak to God on your behalf. Because the curtain was torn. And you can go before God in the name of Jesus Christ. So my question is, have you accepted Jesus? Is He your Lord and Savior? 
Have your sins been taken care of? You see, Jesus' death removed the barrier between us and God. Not just the Jews and God. And that's what the curtain, that symbolized that. But He removed that from us. So that our sin does not have to keep us away from a holy God. Our sin can be forgiven through the blood of Jesus. And we can step boldly into God's presence. God, thank you for what you've done. Are you ready? Because listen, the death rate is 100% if Jesus doesn't come back. Everybody in this room is going to die if Jesus doesn't come back first. Are you ready? Because it could be today. It could be next week. Next month. Next year. We don't know when. So we need to know now that the grace of God has covered us through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus' death removed the barrier between you and God. The curtain is gone. Accept Jesus and be thankful to God. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father, I am so grateful that as bad as I am, as much as I have sinned, you love me. And you gave me the gift of your son, Jesus. You removed the separation between me and you because of the blood of Jesus. So Father, I pray that I live my life in a way that I bring you honor and glory every day. That I may never take for granted what Jesus' death meant for me. So, Father, thank you for the forgiveness that I received through him. Now, Father, I pray that you would speak to the heart of every person that's here today. That we would look inside ourselves and see if the curtain of sin is still there or if it's been removed by Jesus. If there's things that we need to deal with so that our relationship with you is good and strong, help us to deal with those this morning. Thank you, Father, for your presence with us. Speak to our hearts right now. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I try to be as clear as I can. I hope you've heard the good news that Mark gave us today. Man, this is the best news that I can tell you. I can tell you I won the lottery and became rich and I put a million dollars in every one of your bank accounts. And as thrilling as that would be for you, it's nothing compared to what God did for you when He tore when Jesus died. It is a gift that God wants for every man, woman, and child who has ever lived, who will ever live, but we can only receive it if we accept it. If you believe that Jesus is God's Son, yes, God, I believe that. If if you're willing to repent of your sins, and that's not just going, man, I'm sorry I messed up, but I'm going to stay in charge. You say, God, I'm going to let you be in charge. I'm going to let you work. I'm going to let you lead. You just confess. You say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You're saying, I believe that He has taken down the separation between me and my Heavenly Father, and I will accept that gift that He gives to me. Scripture tells us that we need to be baptized in the and listen, that water is not anything special, but what it represents is very special. Water represents the blood of Jesus. It was shed for us on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven. We are eternity. That's what you need to do if you've never done that. You need to remove, accept the removal of sin from your life. Will you do that today? first thing you got. Or maybe you're here this morning and you've been a Christian a while, but you keep grabbing sin like a curtain and throwing it over your window. You don't want people to see what's going on in your life. You know you got all this stuff in there that you're not letting God take care of. And so you're, you're living one way in church. You're living a totally different way when you're out in the community. So you hang the curtains because you don't want anybody to see. How can you not be consistent? To stop 
taking up the sin that Jesus has forgiven in us. Stop taking up that death and walk around with it anymore. And start being disciples of Jesus every day. We go only before God. We have hope before God because of what Jesus did in us. That should make a difference in our lives and how we live. So maybe you just need a little curtain down again and go, God, you have it all. I'm going to expose it all. I'm not going to hide from people anymore. I'm going to allow the Holy Spirit to work in me and we're going to get this thing. Maybe you need to do that today. Maybe you just need us to pray for you. We love to pray in this church. We will pray for you privately. Elders will be up front. If you don't want people to know what's going on, they'll pray right there with you. Or if you want to let our congregation, our family know what's going on, we'll surround you with people. Just ask God to bless you and the purpose of the If you're looking for a church home, we don't have to make this requirements. We just simply ask you to do what Scripture said and has to be immersed in Christ. If you've been immersed in Christ, we're going to welcome you to our family here. And we're going to work together to connect to God, grow in faith, and live and serve. That's why we're here. That's why. If there's something you need to do, if there's a decision that you need to make, don't let Satan keep you from doing that. Don't let him tell you not too, uh, not good enough or you're too good. <coughs> know that your sin can only be taken care of in Jesus Christ. Thank you.